This program is brought to you by Emory University. All right. Hi, good morning. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Stephen Clements, who grew up in Woodbury, Georgia, went to undergrad at Georgia Tech, medical school at Medical College of Georgia, and internal medicine and cardiology fellowship at Emory. Uh, he was also in the U.S. Army Medical Corps, which I didn't know, and he earned the Army Commendation Medal for Meritorious Service. Dr. Clements is the director of the Echo Lab here at Emory. He's been He's a legend. Uh, he's very interested in medical education as well, including teaching EKGs, echoes, and physical exam. He saved the day today because I had a speaker who canceled, and only Dr. Clements, who last minute filled in for me and said, absolutely, I can do clinical conundrums and observations. And I'm glad to see some of our interns here as well. Dr. Clements. Thank you, Pooja. Uh, wonder why the interns are here. <laughs> uh, I was in the Army. So those of you who didn't make it to the Army missed out on a little something. But anyway. So today is a little collection of things that I thought you might like to see. And if you learn one thing today, that will be good. Have no disclosures. And I really like this slide. And this slide, a cartoon, whatever you like, describes what happens with a plaque. Starts out with a plaque and ends up with a myocardial infarction. May end up with an instemi if it doesn't get all the way may end up with a plaque that never ruptures. But uh, this is the whole story right here. Notice that's rupturing at a shoulder, provoking the clotting system, and then uh, trouble is present. So uh, that concept uh, I think about when I see someone with an acute MI. <clears throat> so our first patient. So this gentleman developed chest discomfort. He was a very smart guy. His wife was on it. And he uh, said to his wife that he had chest discomfort. It was about uh, 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, he started breakfast but didn't get very far with it. He said, you know, I feel different in my chest. And his wife uh, was right there. And he says uh, it went on for a short period of time. Five or ten minutes, she says, we're going to the hospital. Put him in the, in the car, went to the emergency room. They saw this EKG. So uh, this was a hospital that did not have a cath lab. So uh, I guess you have to decide then whether or not you might give thrombolytic therapy or whether or not you need to go to the cath lab. So nowadays we go to the cath lab. And uh, notice that uh, those T waves in the precordial leads are peaked. There may be some slight alteration of the anterior forces in V1 and V2. Something's going on, and it's going on right now. So what is going on, and what do we do? So it was 8 o'clock, and you know how the traffic is in Atlanta. So we, uh, we got a call, and they put him in a helicopter. He was outside the perimeter and sent him straight to our calf lab. And in the calf lab... We saw this. You have to look at this carefully because there's uh, fuzziness up there in that LAD after the diagonal. Uh, and if you look downstream in the distal LAD, the LAD is occluded down there. If you look at the diagonal, you notice it's occluded. So what's going on there is that there is a plaque that's ruptured and many thrombi are going downstream. So how do you treat that? Well, we uh, put a stent in there. Some of this opened up, some of it did not open up. So you don't have an opportunity to kind of see it like this very often. Sometimes after angioplasty, when you treat a lesion, 
downstream it goes and uh, we try to catch it sometimes and sometimes we catch it sometimes we don't. So what do we call this? That's how the EKG evolved and in the end that's how the troponins evolved. The troponin was like 80, rapidly dropped. The Q waves in time went away after a month or so. So in our minds what happens is that there's a plaque that builds up and on the other side of this plaque as it humps up, little pieces get chunked downstream and plug up the distal vessels. To treat the proximal lesion, the distal vessels are still occluded. Distal embolization, that's kind of like the vessel is embolizing itself, so you could call that isoembolism. So if you watch for that, you will see that occasionally, and uh, that's probably the mechanism. So when you go to the cath lab with a patient with an acute MI, you usually will have looked at the EKG and you said, well, I can, from this EKG, tell what's going on in the patient. So, uh, you know, I've studied EKGs a long time, and, you know, I can pick them out every time. So with the EKG in mind, you see the EKG, you say, well, I would like to uh, inject the culprit vessel first. Uh, then I'm going to get ready before I change my catheters out, maybe, and uh, get ready with the next one. I'll know what the next artery is and I can go in with maybe a guiding catheter and commit to the next one. So in your minds, if you see this EKG, of course you always have the help of the computer in telling you what's going on. So this is kind of a distressing situation. The patient was having chest discomfort in this EKG SC segments are beginning to rise in the precordial leads. They kind of have that concave appearance to them. So, well, I know what this is. Uh, I'm going to shoot the culprit vessel first. So in your minds, which vessel would you shoot first? So if I'm reading your minds, you would shoot the left artery first. So let's shoot the left artery. So here we go. We're shooting the left artery and we don't see anything. Um, Chris, you want to cut these lights down up here that shine on that? So there's nothing there. So, uh, oops, we make the right diagnosis or not. And next, we uh, shoot the right artery. And we realize that uh, we missed it all together. So there's the EKG, and you say, well, how did I miss that? Well, there's no alteration of the anterior forces. It's kind of a concave upward SC segment elevation. It looks like an acute MI. The computer said it was an acute MI. It said it was anterior injury. So I know that's LAD. Well, there's something else that can explain that. And that's injury to the right ventricle. So uh, the problem was that a small right coronary artery was occluded and the right ventricle was injured. Okay, what about another patient? So this gentleman, was having an endoscopy down in uh, a smaller hospital about 70 miles from here because he had GI bleeding. GI bleeding and stents are not a good problem. So he had um, his endoscopy and when they started on that, chest pain developed. And as a matter of fact, he fibrillated. He had to be defibrillated and resuscitated. They did the EKG and they saw this pattern. So uh, 
say, well, I know all about EKGs and I know which vessel is occluded. So we're going to the cath lab and I'm going to pull out the, uh, my guiding catheter to go ahead and balloon angioplasty and stent that artery, then I'll check the rest of the arteries. So you go shooting the left system where you think the problem is, and you do see a problem up there. See a narrowing the LAD up front, and you decide then to go ahead and and wire that up and stent it. So you're going about your business, you wire it up, you stent it. You might not be using IVUS that day. And you say, well, I just rescued this gentleman. Now I'd better shoot the right coronary artery. So you pull out your right jet or whatever and shoot the right coronary artery and say, whoops, I have stented the wrong vessel. Now I have to work on this one because this one must have caused the trouble. He fibrillated in the GI lab. So you balloon and stent that vessel. And uh, here you are needing aspirin and Plavix and he has GI bleed. So the next thing you do is send him up to our CCU because we're not sure what's gonna happen next. So uh, I happened to be on call that weekend and we were making rounds on, in the CCU and I encountered this man. I'd been given a report the evening before that he was coming and uh, we're probably gonna have to bite the bullet. He was on heparin. He'd received some Plavix and we decided to go ahead and make a move and give him the usual program. So just as soon as we walked out of the coronary care unit, started having chest pain again, the nurses called us back in there. We hooked up the EKG, and that was the EKG. So uh, we said, well, we know all about EKG, so we know now from this EKG, he secluded his LAD probably in his stent because he hadn't had enough Plavix. So what do we do then? We take him to the calf lab, and indeed that's the case. He has occluded his LAD in stent, and we open that bustle up and start it all over and cross our fingers. So in that patient, we had an opportunity to see what it looks like when you have an RV infarction and infarction due to occlusion of the LAD. So uh, all in the same patient, RV infarction due to occlusion of an acute marginal branch of the right, a small non-dominant right. You don't have to worry about them because they'll never hurt you. Almost kill this man. <laughs> and an LAD occlusion in a stent that probably was not applied quite well enough and I uh, had to be rescued from both of those. So just about the time you think you've got everything figured out, you're on the consult service and our wonderful nurse practitioners and PAs bring down an EKG to you and uh, because this man was admitted with chest pain and shortness of breath and show you this EKG. So you say, oh my gosh, there's something terrible going on. And uh, when I put my hands on this axle, it was around the echolapse, so I walked around to the uh, reading room, several fellows there, and uh, they all put forth their opinions we tried to decide what we should do. So uh, in the end, we decided to bring him down to the calf lab as soon as possible. So that's what we did. And we shot what we thought was a culprit vessel, not really. And his LAD was absolutely beautiful. 
Then said, well, let's shoot the right coronary artery. We shot the right coronary artery, and it was beautiful. Said, well, maybe we'd better look at the EKG again. The EKG had not changed. So maybe we better do an echo. So uh, did the echo, and I can tell you in this echo that the left ventricle is moving well and the right ventricle is not moving well. So what did we do next? We did a biopsy of the right ventricle. And he had a lot of inflammatory cells infiltrating the right ventricle, and he seemed to have myocarditis. It seemed to have more effect on the right ventricle than it did the left. So then again, we see that kind of EKG. So here we go with another patient, the bottom line of which need, of whom needs to, uh, ten, tends to tell us that we need to be good electrocardiographers. And we need to be good angiographers, and we need to be able to pick out arteries from any projection. So we have this EKG, and this man who came to the ER, kind of, he kind of had stuttering symptoms. So he went to the cath lab, and uh, we saw this. He's got a very tight lesion up there. Very tight lesion. So what are you supposed to do? You had that EKG that you saw. You're supposed to wire that artery up and put a stent in it. And once you put the stent in it, you say, well, I believe I'll shoot that artery again. When you shoot it, you see something else, which is this vessel here. And if you started from the REO 30 view, you know something about that vessel. And you know which vessel hangs out on the margin of the heart. So you say, oops, I've opened up the diagonal. And furthermore, I have jailed the LAD. And there's the LAD, so what do I do now? Well. I tried to get the wire down the LAD. I tried to get the wire down the LAD. I let him go back to his room. I bring him back. I tried to get the wire down the LAD, and I can't get the wire down the LAD. So I've jailed the LAD. Well, he's not having any pain, so we'll watch him along. So that's what we did. Oh, that's what they did. Not too long after that, he appeared in my office. And the question was, what do we do about this? I'll tell you, the bottom line is, as time went on, things healed, and we wound up having to bypass him. And he actually is doing well now, but there's a lesson in that. You say, where is the diagonal? We opened up the diagonal, and we jailed the LAD. So the diagonal is out on the margin of the heart in this view. So that's one point in favor of doing a 30-degree RAO view to start out with because you know the diagonal is going to be out on the margin and the LAD is going to be within the margin. And the LAD goes down like that. So if you look for that every time, you might not miss that. So there's a lesson about coronary anatomy. Okay, so... This happened uh, within the month of February. So this gentleman came down. He clearly was having unstable angina. His EKG looked like that. He'd had an old inferior, probably true posterior. So he went to the calf lab. And in the calf lab, he's got a total right. You can see the PDA down at the bottom of the screen. It's a chin shot, so the LAD is in the middle of the screen. He's got a significant intramyocardial, big septal perforator there, you see. And he's got a diagonal up there. And in other views, it kind of has a marginal that's small. 
So we pondered over what to do, and we picked out some targets. It's got left main up there also, so we said, well, it is hard to treat that left main, treat that circumflex out there. Can't do anything about the right. So we let him go to surgery. So we had a triple bypass to those targets that I showed you, lima to the LAD, saphenous vein graft to the PDA and OM. And the first day after surgery, I had a short run of non-sustained VT, long enough for him to get some lidocaine, which settled him down. The next day, you know, we don't do a lot of EKGs in the surgical ICU anymore. So next day he had this EKG, which that was first day, second day. Uh, he had an EKG that called him to call a calf lab. They didn't call me, they called Tanvir. Then Tanvir called me. So here we are with this man is sitting there feeling okay. And he had this EKG. So what does that represent? So they were, they were ready for us to take him to the calf lab. And uh, we almost did. So maybe that's pericarditis. You know, the vector of pericarditis is down toward the apex. It's not out like that. So here we go, V1 to V4, if that's these segments elevated. How are you feeling? I'm feeling fine. Uh, should we go to the calf lab? It's about 4.30 in the afternoon. It's always a tough time. So what is this? So uh, what do we do next? We were racking our brains about those ST segments. Has he occluded his IMA? So we did some tropes, and the troponins came back not much of anything. So uh, there we were, and we all decided that maybe we should do something else, so I decided this. So I went back down to the calf lab, and I looked at his pictures. I knew his right was total, and I knew that he had something we couldn't touch, but you know, it's just after the first part of the right, there's a very, very tight lesion. It's total after that acute marginal. So uh, we didn't take him to the cath lab to demonstrate what happened here because we all felt like we knew what happened. And we felt like that he occluded that proximal lesion in the right coronary artery and he isolated those acute marginal branches. And that EKG that he had probably represented right ventricular injury. Troponins didn't go anywhere, things settled down, and he went home the other day. So right ventricular infarction or right ventricular injury, if you think of it in terms of vector, that the vector over there on your left is a vector from one of Dr. Hurst's books. Our man's vector was a little bit leftward from that, but it was anterior. And uh, we knew that his LAD territory moved well because we had looked at that on ECHO. So there it was up there in the surgical ICU, and after seeing this a number of times, you have to condition yourself to, uh, to figure it out. So uh, Spencer King is not here today, but I had this for him. So. Years ago, I had kind of saved this situation. This man came in with a small inferior MI, and he had a calf. And that was his right coronary artery. And if you look at that right in the middle of the screen, there's a small acute marginal branch there. You know what do we do? We uh, I think we just ballooned it. I don't think we had stents then. So we ballooned it. 
say, well, we did a good job. We're going to send him back around to 4G. As soon as he gets back around to 4G, he has this lingering chest discomfort. So uh, in that situation, you know, before you can even do it yourself or order it or whatever, the nurses call you with the EKG. And here's the EKG. Uh, this was 1995. And he has this SC segment elevation across his precordium there. And uh, that caused him to go back to the cath lab. Went back to the cath lab with that. And uh, if you look at the pictures after that, you'll find that that marginal is missing. This is a, that's a don't get that confused with this vessel is missing. So here we were again with a right ventricular injury pattern that actually we did go back to the cath lab with. See that vessel initially down to the left in the left corner there. So right ventricular injury. So now we're going to change the subject. So that's right ventricular injury. So maybe if that's all you learned today or learn to recognize that learn to condition yourself to recognize that situation. It comes in all kinds of packages, up in the 5E unit, uh, in the emergency room, everywhere. So if you learn that, that's it. So I've, I've noticed that uh, when we ask questions about some of these images I'm going to show next, uh, it's very confusing to people. And uh, they commonly give the wrong, almost every time they give the wrong answer. So, uh, as I said, things come in funny packages, like one clinic day in North Carolina, they actually wheel this man around to, uh, to one of my examining rooms. He'd been in the hospital for two weeks, he'd been short of breath. He'd been turned down for surgery at another place. A friend of his in church had had surgery for the same thing, and he died. And there he was in my office. So uh, I put my stethoscope on his chest, and he had a loud murmur. So what was it, Mon? Mitral valve, so. <laughs> <laughs> How did you know that? <laughs> uh, so he had acute mitral regurgitation. He'd ruptured a cord. So what kind of people ruptured cord, ruptured cord? So you need to know a little bit about the anatomy. And I, I love this diagram because it helps out a lot. You need to recognize the mitral aortic curtain that's sitting out there all the time. We do our echoes. You need to recognize the sinuses and how they relate to that. Notice how the non-coronary sinus is kind of dominant over this mitral valve. Notice how these trigones are there. Uh, the trigones are part of the cardiac skeleton. Notice how instead of the mitral valve being perfectly round, it kind of squares off at the top there. This is a surgeon's view. And that line is kind of parallel to the top of the screen. If you're visualizing this on the screen, or if your surgeon is pointing toward the, squared away toward the head. The uh, circumflex artery is there. If you're a surgeon, you're sewing in a valve, and you take a bite that's too deep, you're going to tie off the circumflex. And the coronary sinus. Notice in this view over to the left is the left atrial appendage that we all are aware of these areas of the mitral valve, and there's a C area of the mitral valve. Those commissures don't go all the way to the annulus. And up there is a bundle of his. It's penetrating a very famous area of the heart, which is called a central fibrous body. Central fibrous body. So the his bundle goes right through there. You can imagine how calcification of mitral annulus 
thickening calcification of the cardiac skeleton would uh, cut off the bone lipids. You say, what does the cardiac skeleton do other than support the heart? Well, you know, the, the, the cardiac skeleton is made of fibrous tissue and it insulates the ventricle from the atria. So there's only one place that those electrical impulses can go, and that's through the bundle of hits. So this is the image that confuses folks. So that's because, that's because we don't show them enough 3D images. So I, where the red arrow is up, is up there, and then from an oblique view, look at it this way. So in your minds, what, what is this? So is it a myxoma? Is it a papillary fibroelastoma? What is it? So uh, John Ricketts and I know what it is because we see it. So it makes a little difference if you look at it in motion, but once you get on to what it is, you kind of have this in your mind. So when you think about degenerative mitral valve disease, think about two big, car, uh, two big categories. Number one, fibroelastic deficiency when there's just not enough connective tissue in that valve and parts of it stretch. And the Barlow's valve, which you got too much tissue in, too much, everything stretches. Um, all leaflets, just a very difficult to deal with. So the common one you see in the gentleman who I just showed you is that fibroelastic deficiency. And for some reason, it likes to get P2 over there. And once it starts, the more prolapse it gets, the higher the, the surface area, the higher the pressure, and the more stretching it does. And uh, the the Barlow's valve, as we call it up at the top, prolapses above the mitral annulus, as you see in the little stick diagram there. But the fibroelastic deficiency valve prolapses only in that one segment. Sometimes it can be other places, but it's diagrammatically illustrated there. I love this diagram right here, which shows how the mitral valve is continuous to the aortic valve, the central fibrous body there. Uh, and ordinarily that comes straight down. Uh, P2 prolapse is a common thing. It's just surgeons, surgeons do that. And they like to do that, do, do a good job of it. So if I had shown you this in motion, you probably would have gotten what it is. This 3D image of that segment of the mitral valve is just a little lateral to... Uh, P2, and that is all the MR that you have there, all the signs of severe MR with just flow disturbance in the left atrial appendage and in the pulmonary vein. And when you look at it in 2D, you see that leaflet that shoots up there and causes that jet to head up toward the aorta. And that's the murmur of mitral regurgitation that can mimic aortic stenosis because the jet is running parallel to it. Furthermore, as a matter of fact, this very patient, when I was called about this patient, they said, oops, I missed something. This patient has severe aortic stenosis because of the Doppler pattern. So when the Doppler is parallel to the aortic valve there and the aorta, uh, if you move it over just a little bit, it looks like you've got a velocity of six. And that'll cause you to say this patient has severe aortic stenosis. Furthermore, the murmur sounds like aortic stenosis. Furthermore, you need to send him and get him a tabber right quick. So that's how he came to me. So there's some little things you can squeeze out of this if you push another button. And if you know where that jet is and you have that view up there and you push the button, 
the M mode button and the color M mode, you'll find that the murmur of mocking regurgitation goes through the aortic closure. It goes to and beyond aortic closure. And it goes to and beyond aortic closure that much. And that much happens to be the isovolemic relaxation time. And you can measure that using that. There are lots of other different ways you can measure it. But you can measure it using that. So uh, that's a cheap way, but that's physiology and Wigger's diagram. So how do you get all mixed up with that? So you have this view from transthoracic and you kind of edge over from here to here and suddenly these velocities go up or you go from, then you say, well, we've got uh, serious aortic stenosis here. When all along you have no aortic stenosis, that's the jet of micro regurgitation and they're parallel often in that situation. We get into that all the time with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, well, is this a MR jet or is this a jet through the LVO <coughs> So it gets really confusing when you turn on the color Doppler, but if you'll squint your eyes a little bit, you can see how that jet actually is going up toward the left atrial appendage. You remember the diagram that left atrial appendage goes over at the nine o'clock. It's going up toward the aorta and the left atrial appendage. It disturbed flow in the left atrial appendage. So that is, uh, by looking at that, you say, well, there's P2 prolapse. And it's trying to trick us with all its mimics. When you look at the other views, in the bicommissural view, you'll see the P2 area prolapsing up, producing that mass. And if you uh, look at the three-dimensional images, you see this giant area here. And if you look at that very carefully, you'll see the ruptured cords. You know, in uh, 2D images, temporal resolution is better. For these images, you really have to look to see the ruptured cords. Right in there in systole. So I was concerned about this. And uh, all this area that that leaflet occupied. So when I talked with the surgeon, I said, you know, I, does it bother you that that area prolapse is so large that you have to resect that? Might you be tightening up the mitral annulus too much? And uh, just in a millisecond, he said, oh, no, no, no. He said, we use neocords for that. Two or three neocords, and we never, we don't cut that leaflet out. We pull it down. And... Uh, Actually, when that happened, he, uh, he sent me this picture of this patient. See the fibroelastic deficiency in here? See this? See the rest of the cords? So uh, he sent me this picture. And uh, then he sent me another picture. <coughs> and this was a picture of surgery. And there are the neocords. So we put those three cords and they pulled it down. He allowed the anterior leaflet to coapt. And that's the end result. Uh, so this man uh, walked out of the hospital doing well. So that's P2 prolapse. That's fibroelastic deficiency. Uh, that's ruptured cords. That's how you repair it, how that entity can mimic aortic stenosis, and how it did in this patient. So keep that in mind, and with that, we'll stop. Okay? The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.